whose we are uh, in the nation. Uh, and so just a reminder of that today as we enter into our scripture readings and our message and continue our worship. I want to offer up a prayer for us this morning as we prepare to do that. Uh, the praise team's going to come and lead us in some music. Uh, we'll hear some scripture. We'll hear a little bit of preaching. We'll go have some holy communion. And it's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for the gift of this day. And we pray now that you will pour out your spirit upon all of us. We come to worship prepared to and anticipating and desiring of participation. We come not to be entertained, not to just be uh, passive observers, but we come to worship, to engage, to participate, to contribute. So fill our hearts this morning, guide us and lead us, open our minds to that which you would have us hear and experience this day as we come as a community of faith, the congregation of your people, praise you and to worship you. It's in the powerful name of the resurrected Christ we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, friends, let's stand and sing a little bit.
got it on the outside The outside looking in This is where faith begins We were hungry, we were thirsty With nothing left to give All the shape that we were in comfortable but not too comfortable <laughs> and folks sitting at your kitchen table come to the table uh, as the sparrows just saying we are celebrating holy communion on this first sunday in july welcome to trinity united methodist church 
for our virtual worship experience. Uh, we are celebrating Holy Communion, and so I invite you to, uh, to have some juice and bread or water and bread available uh, for a little bit later in our worship experience as we all share, whether in person here uh, or wherever you might be this morning, share in communion with God in bread and cup. Uh, welcome to uh, our virtual church. Today we're hearing a story from the Old Testament uh, that is uh, a different kind of independence, uh, but it reminds us of who we are and whose we are and uh, the nature of what freedom and independence looks like as children of God. So I'm going to ask Ashley McGuire to come up. Ashley is going to read our Old Testament lesson from 2 Kings this morning, and I think it's on the big screen for you to follow along if you'd like. Uh, Ashley, let me say this um, um, first. Let me say this prayer and then we'll get started, all right? So, Holy God, pour out your Spirit upon us now as your Word is read and proclaimed. Open our hearts and our minds, open our eyes and our ears to experience you in the fullest today. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Naaman, a general for the king of Aram, was a great man and highly regarded by his master. Because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. This man was a mighty warrior, but he had a skin disease. Now Aramean raiding parties had gone out and captured a young girl from the land of Israel. She served, Naaman, she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master could come before the prophet who lives in Samaria. He would cure him of his skin disease. So Naaman went and told his master that the young girl from the land of Israel had said. Then Aram's king said, go ahead, I will send a letter to Israel's king. So Naaman left. He took along ten kikars of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. He brought the letter to Israel's king. It read, along with this letter, I'm sending you my servant, Naaman so you can cure him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he ripped his clothes. He said, what am I God to hand out death and life? But this king writes me, asking me to cure him of his skin disease. You must realize that he wants to start a fight with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that Israel's king had ripped his clothes, he sent word to the king. Why did you rip your clothes? Let the man come to me. Then he'll know that there's a prophet in Israel. Naaman arrived with his horses and chariots. He stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent out a messenger who said, Go and wash seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and become clean. But Naaman went away in anger. He said, I thought for sure that he'd come out. Stand and call in the name of the Lord, his God. Wave his hand over the bad spot and cure the skin disease. Aren't the rivers in Damascus, the Abana and the Farper, better than all Israel's waters? Couldn't I wash in them and get clean? So he turned away and proceeded to leave in anger. Naaman's servants came up to him and spoke to him. Our father, if the prophet had told you to do something difficult, wouldn't you have done it? All he said to you was, wash and become clean. So Naaman went down and bathed in the Jordan seven times, just as the man of God had said. His skin was restored like that of a young boy, and he became clean. And friends, the good news this morning from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 and 16. After these things, the Lord commissioned 72 others and sent them on ahead in pairs to every city and place he was about to go. And Jesus said to them, whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. Whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. Friends, these are the words of God for I want to thank Ashley for uh, 
her leadership this morning in our worship. Uh, Ashley is our liturgist and worship leader alongside Turner uh, for the month of July, for the next few weeks, and I'm grateful for that. Um, you may have noticed that uh, throughout the, uh, the summer months since Pentecost Sunday on the first Sunday in June that we have been trying to uh, incorporate some additional uh, voices in our worship experience each week. Uh, in this service uh, for the month of June, Julie was our scripture reader and our liturgist each week. Uh, and starting in the month of July, we're expanding that role with Ashley, who will be leading us uh, most, if not all, Sundays in the month of July as well. She joins uh, Turner, who is uh, leading us in that Holy Spirit prayer as we begin our worship. Uh, and we've shifted the music around a little bit. Uh, we've, and some Sundays, we've had some increased dialogue, some conversation during the message uh, time during the service. Uh, all ways in which we are trying to incorporate additional voices to be heard in our worship life of our church. Last week, Deborah Williamson brought us the message of her experience in battling cancer uh, and the role that her faith played in that. And the week before that, we heard our youth and our children talk about their mission trip and share songs and verses of scripture from their life story and their experience. In two weeks from today, on the 17th of July, Megan Madison will be here. Uh, Megan is Pat Madison's daughter, and she'll be sharing the story of her progression, if you will, her faith journey uh, that has moved her from growing up in this church and the role that this church played in her faith formation to where she is today in seminary studying, studying her Islamic faith. And then, of course, the end of the month of July, on the 31st, we'll all be participating in worship uh, as we gather here for an act of service as worship, uh, putting together those 25,000 meals as we rise up against hunger. You may notice, too, if you are observant, that our worship leaders and liturgists and our uh, speakers oftentimes during our worship experience are women, uh, and that is intentional. Uh, because um, it is a, an attempt to hear another voice besides the old white man. Um, and no, and, but that's important. It's really important. It's important for, uh, for women to be able to understand that they have a voice in the church and not to be, uh, to be excluded because the pastor is male. Uh, and you guys know that in the history of this congregation. You've had women as pastors for a long time. But it's really important that younger women and our youth and children also see that and receive that and participate in hearing those feminine voices in worship. Our stories shared also, if you've noticed, if you've been paying attention, uh, our stories that we've been sharing throughout the month of June so far and will continue through the summer uh, are represented in artifacts being left at the cross. The wind saw came from the Pentecost Sunday. The wind blows where it will and no one knows where it comes from, uh, as Jesus said, talking about the Holy Spirit uh, and then, of course, the Spirit being poured out in what looked like tongues of fire and sounded like a rushing wind. The red hat that's on the arm of the cross is Deborah's from last Sunday. That was her Christmas stocking, so to speak, that covered her head during her intense period of chemotherapy. Also at the foot of the cross are work shirts that our youth contributed, uh, a reminder of their experience working for Christ and serving others in Altoona, Pennsylvania this summer. And on the little box there, if you can make it out, are a pair of tap shoes, dancing shoes. On Trinity Sunday, we celebrated how the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are engaged in a circle dance of love. Uh, and that's the, the symbol, the reminder of us of that lesson. All of these things, all of these things, the, the voices that we're hearing, the stories we're hearing, the artifacts that remind us of these things, all point to this. And if I can paraphrase the prophets, it would be, wake up, people, listen to this. God is using unlikely people to bring an unexpected word. God is using unlikely people to bring an unexpected word. And that's, my friends, is what happened to Naaman. See, Naaman was a mighty general in the land of Aram. He had been conquering nations left and right. He was good at his job. 
He was a mighty warrior or general. He commanded armies, and he was successful when he went to battle. He returned not recently from uh, a battle in Israel where he had conquered the Israel kingdom, conquered Samaria and Israel on behalf of Aram or what we would now know today as Syria. He was good at being a general and a commanding army officer. But there was one thing that Naaman couldn't do, and that was he couldn't cure himself of his leprosy, of his skin disease. Leprosy in that day and age was not curable by human hands. And so on his most recent foray into Israel, he had brought back with him a slave girl, a servant girl, as the scripture calls it, a young girl who was captured and brought back and given to Naaman's wife, uh, Mrs. Naaman, we shall call her, uh, given to Mrs. Naaman uh, so that she could be, the little girl could be her servant. And the little girl living in the household with Mr. and Mrs. Naaman observed how, uh, how the leprosy, the skin disease, was causing such suffering for Mr. Naaman. And she offered one day to her master, Mrs. Naaman, I know a guy. I got a guy back home. I got a guy who can cure this. He's a prophet in Samaria. And Mrs. Naaman told Mr. Naaman, who went to the king, and the king gave him permission to go to Israel to seek out the healing that he sought because he was in such distress. The king wrote him a letter, one king to another. Hey, here's my guy. He's coming down, and he's looking for a cure. And the king gave him Money, lots and lots of money. One article I read this week said that it would be well over a million dollars today. Now that's a high cost of health care in the seven under the seventh century BCE, right? Lots of money and some clothing and some material and cloth and things, all ways of demonstrating how important this was to uh, not just Naaman but to Naaman's king to find relief from the suffering. For his general. So Naaman loads up his entourage, he gets on his horse, soldiers get on their horses, they load up some chariots, they carry some servants along, and off they head to Israel. And when they get to the king, on the word of this little servant girl, this young servant girl, when they get to the king, the king has a meltdown because he believes he's being set up for failure. Because, see, that while the little servant girl had this tremendous faith that the man of God, the prophet in Samaria, could heal Naaman, which no human can do, could heal him from leprosy, the king saw no such pathway forward. The king was overwhelmed with the threat of failure. Because see, the king didn't have faith in God, the king relied on his faith. He placed his trust in his own self. And in, the, in the, and in the power of his government. And his government and he, neither one, could affect healing for this mighty warrior from the land of Haram. So when we look at that and see how this, this young girl had the faith of God, that she would be willing to, to advise Naaman where to go to get healing, and that she was confident, she knew that the prophet could heal him. The king instead responded in fear and trepidation because he knew that he was going to be at the, at the short end of this stick if, in fact, he did not heal Naaman. Elisha, the prophet, becomes, hears word of, this, um, of Naaman having come to town, and he sends word to the king, don't be upset, I got this. Send him to me that he might know that there is a prophet in the land of Samaria. And so the king does. And Naaman and his soldiers get back on their horses and they go to Elisha's house. Naaman, the soldiers, the servants, the carriages and, and the chariots. And they all go to Naaman's house and pull up out front. And Naaman, the mighty warrior general who commands respect in his land, that when he enters a room, people stand up and his soldiers do whatever he tells them to do. When they get to Elisha's house, Elisha doesn't even come out. Elisha doesn't show him any respect at all for his power, his privilege, his status. If anything, Elijah just disses Naaman right there. And that makes Naaman mad that Elisha wouldn't even come out. 
Naaman was convinced that Elisha would come out and wave his hands over him or say some prayer or incantation or anoint him with oil or do something, do something to take away this dreaded leprosy from which he was suffering. See, Naaman was slowly, slowly moving towards acknowledging and accepting that he could not fix this himself and that he was going to have to be dependent on someone else to do it. But even as he approached the moment of receiving his healing, of being saved from his suffering, he still wanted to do it his way. Naaman wants healing to be on his terms. In both the Hebrew and the Greek of the Old and New Testament, the words that are used for healing also are used for salvation and for deliverance. Naaman wanted salvation on his own terms. Let's let that sink in for a moment, Jesus' followers. Wanting deliverance Salvation, healing on his own terms. He had expectations for how he should be healed. Elisha tells him to go dip himself in the river Jordan seven times. Bathe yourself seven times. And that'll take care of the problem. Naaman becomes even more angry now. Because he's traveled all this way and he's gone to all this trouble and he's gotten his letter from the king and he's brought all of his soldiers and all of his servants and all of the stuff, including all of that money, to pay for somebody to heal him. And he's being told to go dip himself in the nasty Jordan River. If I'm going to dip in the rivers, I'll go back home because the rivers at home are better than the rivers in Israel. He says, my rivers are better than your rivers. Naaman's still clinging. He's still holding on to who he is. And as he prepares to depart again from now Elisha's house, unsatisfied, unhealed, uncured, it is his servants. The lowly servants, once again, who speak up and say, Mr. Naaman, if the prophet had said for you to do something that was difficult, would you have done it? Here the prophet is offering you a simple way to be cured, to be healed, to be delivered. What's the risk? Go to the Jordan and bathe seven times, and if you're healed, We'll praise God, and if not, we'll get on our horses and go back home. And in that moment, if you will, the the third offer from the poor servants of God, Naaman obeys. Naaman surrenders. And he comes down off his high horse and gets into the Jordan River and seven times he washes and when he comes out, his suffering is gone. His pain is gone. The scars are gone. The lesions are gone. He has been healed just as Elisha said he would. It is the slave girl and the servants and the poor prophet, who will take none of the money, my, my gifts, my word given to you through me is not for sale. It is the slave girl and the servants and the poor prophet who guide the powerful Naaman to humility, to surrender. And in that surrender, he is healed. No doubt you knowledgeable Old Testament scholars picked up on the fact that this story took place some six or seven hundred years before Christ came. But the deliverance of Naaman in the waters of the Jordan 
the salvation of Naaman, the relief from his pain and suffering and the scars of this world for this man who humbled himself. Naaman was a foreigner in the land of Israel. He was a Gentile. And he was an enemy. And yet God chose him through the works of Elisha to be saved. From that moment on, Naaman began to worship God and carry that, that message of his experience and his salvation back to Aram. But it was in the voices of the unlikely, the voices that were not in Naaman's normal circle or sphere of influence, that led him to this moment of healing this moment of wholeness. And so, friends, I'm curious today, who are the voices that are trying to get our attention? On July the 3rd, 2022. Who are the unlikely voices that God is using to communicate with us? or to try to communicate with us. Who is the unlikely person who comes bearing a word from God to point us toward our future as a community of faith, as a congregation here in Chesterfield County? May we be open to the unlikeliest of voices. May we be open and receptive to the messages they bring. Amen and amen. Friends, the scriptures tell us that on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, Jesus and his closest friends gathered in an upper room in Jerusalem. It was the celebration of the Passover when they shared in a meal together and remembered their past, how God had heard their cries and sent an unlikely voice and leader to call them home, Moses an unlikely messenger to deliver them from oppression. Among these friends gathered around the table, Jesus took bread and having blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them and said to them, this is my body given for you. And then in the same way, he took the cup of wine and after giving thanks for it, he passed the cup among his disciples saying, this is my blood, the sign of the new covenant of forgiveness, of healing given for you. When you eat this bread and drink from this cup, remember me. That night, as he so often did, in sharing meals with his friends and with strangers alike, Jesus transformed a celebration of remembrance, a celebration of the past, into hope for the future. So now, following Jesus' example, we will take this bread and this juice of the grape, the ordinary things of this world through which God will bless us, 
As Jesus gave thanks for the gifts of the earth, let us celebrate God's goodness. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Friends, let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, for you have brought forth bread from the earth. Blessed are you, O God, for you have created the fruit of the vine. In the beginning you breathed the breath of life upon all your creation, and it was so very good. You watered the earth that human beings might have food and drink, and by such gifts you sustain us, and by the gift of Christ you redeem us. Just as you gave Jesus his daily bread to share with the blind, the seekers, the disillusioned, the sick, that they would be healed for their life's journey, we now come to your table to receive the bread of life and cup of salvation for ours to heal us and nourish us as sons and daughters. And so with all our sisters and brothers beside us and before us, we praise you from our hearts for your unending greatness. Holy God, present with us now as we do in this place what your son Jesus did in an upstairs room, breathe your spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and cup that they may be for us heaven's food and drink, renewing, sustaining, and making us whole, that we may be your body here on earth, loving and caring in the world, until Christ comes again in final victory. And all God's people said, Amen. Friends, let us boldly pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Friends, this morning we have bread, whole loaf bread, and um, the finest grape juice that we can obtain. We also have gluten-free crackers for those that desire or prefer them. The bread of life. And the cup of salvation, the gifts of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. Amen. Ashley, if you will come and help me. Friends, I'm going to invite you to uh, come down the center aisle as you feel led. I will give you a piece of bread, and Ashley will extend to you uh, the tray with the little cups of juice, which you may choose one. You are invited to come to the kneeling rails, the altar rails, if you'd like. There are trash cans available at the end of each aisle. The table is set, and this table belongs to the Lord. It does not belong to this church or to, uh, to me as pastor. This is an open table where any foreigner, alien, enemy is welcome. Come, my friends.
All right, if y'all rise with us for our closing song here, He Reigns. receive this blessing. May the God who heals accompany you with hope so that you may face life's uncertainties. May the teacher, Jesus Christ, send you out as disciples certain of his words and power. And may the Holy Spirit fill you with an unceasing desire to do good wherever you find yourself. Blessed are the ones who go in the name of the Lord. So go in peace in that name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.